to another inspiration from Ken Park at Fallingbrook Heights Baptist Church at the Center. Here's Ken. Welcome to Life 101. Take off your life's backpack, have a seat, take a deep breath, and let's rest for a while. Let me tell you this story. In the simple southwest, there was a river. On either side of that river, there was two cities in which the residents sought to enjoy life and to prosper and build community. One night, a storm raged over both cities. The rains came and the winds blew, and the crescendo of the storm was marked by three lightning strikes, which seemed to wake up everyone in the Twin Cities, except for the two that it indelibly but imperceptibly changed. Sarah Livingston, Jonathan Riley slept through the storm. They woke up the next morning. Sarah Livingston in the Graceway Hospital. Jonathan Livingston in the hotel. Each one of them were impacted by a form of amnesia that limited what they knew about themselves, what they had been doing, their understanding. Though they didn't know it at the time, what linked them together was represented in their backpacks, which matched and had similar labels of their names, their address of different units of the same place, 1840 Thin Ribbon Road, and inside the backpacks were six plus one items. Through the adventures that hey, they had worked through, they sought to regain their memory through the contents of their backpack and they were led by their friends who they met along the way. Sarah had met Anya, a volunteer at the Graceway Hospi Hospital, and Jonathan had met Dr. Arnborg, who he called Dr. A, at the hotel and ultimately the coffee shop. They were all, all four of them, from 1840 Thin Ribbon Road, and they were reunited together in the uh, main entrance of the Graceway Hospital. It was there we catch up with them. After their initial greeting, Sarah and Jonathan lost in relief and peace of finding each other. Anya arranged for her replacement at the volunteer booth that she worked at and pointed towards the salad surgery restaurant and food court. She motioned for them to go with her there, and when they went to a corner with four seats that was quiet, she motioned for a friend of hers who was working at the restaurant to come over and... She gave the order for all four of them to have lunch. All four of them settled into their chairs and Dr. Arnborg started the conversation. Like a great mentor, he asked for Jonathan's backpack and he slowly began to withdraw the items from the backpack and began. He said, you are loved, so says the card. The property owner of 1840 Thin Ribbon Road, the great master, the eternal father, loves you. He's looking forward to your return. But there's more you need to know. Your existence matters as matter. The clothes indicate every day as you live that the master, needs, uh, the master loves you and provides for your needs. But there's more you need to know. You have origin and destination. A home where these keys work, but there's more you need to know. He continued in Jonathan's backpack and withdrew the other items. He said, you're part of a community. A picture of us gathered in this picture. Scattered community that you'll meet over time, but there's more you need to know. You are sustained, you are provided for, you are given grace. We still interact with this grace and share it and refine it, but there's more you need to know. We have choice and determination to decide on what we're given in life, but there's more you need to know. And you and I have made errors recorded in this smudged journal, which we all take part of. He paused, and all four of them said, but there's more we need to know. Sarah, Sarah and Jonathan nodded in agreement, and uh, as they 
began to think of these things, they realized as their memories were coming back that they were best friends, true brother and sister of each other, great helpers of each other. Uh, they began to realize that uh, each of them had relationships of romance, but these relationships had not threatened the relationship that Sarah had with Jonathan and Jonathan with Sarah. They, would, they knew they were a family of sorts. Other questions flooded their mind, but Sarah and Jonathan were content for the moment. Their food came, and the three younger of the group dove into their salads with great hunger. When the salads were finished, Jonathan began to repack his bag. As Sarah apologized and returned her keys to Anya, the keys that she had mistakenly taken, and Anya admired Sarah's clothes. Jonathan placed the card and the journal and the picture in his front, front pouch of his backpack. He assembled his clothes and the care kit. He tucked the black card into his pocket and the dice into the velvet bag. And at last, Jonathan took his keys. And beginning to clip them on the inside of his bag, zipped up his bag. But before he could get all the way to the top, Sarah, Sarah reached over and touched Jonathan's arms. Wait, she said, the key. She reached for her keys and held out similar brass keys, each marked with number 37. Each of them, key with their hand, held them up. They were exact. The only difference, an extra key, tooth, on Jonathan's key. Jonathan and Sarah turned to the other two, to Anya, to Dr. Arnborg, and asked them in unison, do, do, do you know about these keys? With quizzical looks, Dr. Arnborg and Anya indicated they didn't. The keys together, though, triggered Sarah's memory. She said excitedly, we arrived in the Twin Cities a week ago. A West Side law firm, she couldn't quite remember the name of the law firm, but a West Side law firm had an opportunity for you, Jonathan, to article in. A new firm, a new life. I joined you coming here to finish my master's degree in philanthropy through an internship with the David Christos Foundation. We arrived, and because your interview was that day, we took our bags and we put them at the train station in the locker. These keys are for locker number 37 at the train station. Well, th that's where your other clothes are, said Anya. Perhaps that's where the phone is. Well, what are we waiting for? said Dr. Arnborg. The train station isn't too far. And the three began to, to rise in order to leave, but Sarah remained seated and started to tear up. The other three sat down in respect, and Anya held on to Sarah's shaking hands, careful about her wrists and her hands, who were, which was still recovering from injury. Sarah sobbed with s smiles and bursts of laughter. I know it doesn't make sense, but it's all coming back, she said. For the first time in my life, I believe, I really feel loved, relaxed, and it's a little overwhelming. She reached into her bag and withdrew her journal and turned to the last entry, seeming to take the hint Jonathan did the same Sarah turned to the last page and began to read just as Jonathan whispered the same words from his journal. In love, matter, with origin and destination, a member of our community sustained by my father, I choose in favor of us, accepting your forgiveness and the care for what I've done wrong. Thank you for your encouragement and how you give me life. With the journal open, she turned the page over to Jonathan and Jonathan offered 
her his journal, and as they'd done many times, they exchanged and began to write encouraging notes with tears in the entries. Hmm. After a long silence, Sarah then closed Jonathan's journal, handed it back to him, and he gave Sarah back to hers, and without reading, they slid it into their backpacks. She foisted her pack on her shoulders and said, Dr. Arnborg, take us to the station. The four left Graceway Hospital, turned left on Magna Street and walked, eagerly chatting about anything at all that came up. And 47 minutes later, through a maze of back streets and boulevards, they stood in front of the River Street Station. Jonathan was tired. He needed a break. But Anya was on a mission. They weaved through the travelers at the train station and found where the lockers were. Instinctively, they split up and began to look for number 37. After a short time, they all heard Jonathan's voice. Hey, it's here! As he stood in front of number 37. They found him. Sarah withdrew her key as well too and holding it up together. Anya then said, well, uh, open it already. They slid the keys into the locker effortlessly. And they both turned and opened the locker. Like a drama about a safety deposit box. They opened the large docker locker door. Two bags matching their backpacks sat neatly side by side. They withdrew their bags and looked at the tags. On each of the tags on their suitcases was a pocket that held two cards, an identity card and an emergency contact card. And after seeing their names on that pocket and their address, Thin Ribbon Road, their phone number, similar to that which was on their backpack, they looked at the card, the identity card, withdrawing it from the pouch. They began to read each one stopping at times and the other one filling it in, the exact same things on both of their cards. And the cards on their suitcases read this. Identity, child of the father, friend, justified, bought with a price, chosen and adopted, redeemed and forgiven, secure, free from condemnation, citizen of heaven, given a spirit of power, love, and sound mind. Significant, a reconciler, special possession, treasured, irreplaceable, loved beyond compare, forgiven, set free, set apart, precious to the master and father. <sighs> With great satisfaction, they put the identity card back in the pouch and withdrew the emergency contact card. And it said, in case of emergency, Please contact the master, 1840 Thin Ribbon Road, 754-324-4479. Standing in the train station in front of the locker, locker, we leave Jonathan and Sarah. Considering their incredible, incredible identity and the emergency contact card, we turn to the greatest source of identity and rescue ever, the Bible. Regardless of where you are today, you need to know that God gives you identity. He gives you rescue. It's the heart of the Bible. The Bible gives us a profound message of the redemption of humanity. It's certainly beyond our time together today to comprehensive evaluate this profound subject of identity, of emergency, contact. But we're going to take a look at five texts and conclude with five truths. The first text we're going to take a look at is in Psalm 139. But we know from this psalm that your identity was set in the earliest moments of your existence. Because he knows you completely. Psalm 139, 13 to 16 says this, For you created my inmost being, 
You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. The second truth we read in the Bible is that your identity was set in adoption into God's family as his child. And we can call out to him. Tells us in Romans 8, 15, the spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God, co-heirs with Christ if indeed we share in his sufferings, in order that we may also share in his glory. The third thing we learn about identity in the Bible, found in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, tells us that your identity is a gift from God, salvation through grace, so we do his good work. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 tells us this, For it is by grace you've been saved through faith. This is not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by work so that no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. The fourth identity that we can learn from the Bible amongst many things we can learn is that our identity is hidden in Christ and he will appear in glory when he returns. Colossians 3, 3 says, Since then you've been raised with Christ, set your heart on things above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things, for you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. The fifth truth that we consider today about our identity is that our identity is knit together with each other, and we praise the one who called us into light. 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10 says, You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. As we consider on this leg of our journey with the second leg of our journey with Sarah and Jonathan, we consider our identity, our identity and our rescue, our security, our emergency contact. We can know as we wrestle with these things that our identity in Christ journeying together, our identity in Christ brings about the fulfillment of what Christ had originally intended for us. So let's consider these five truths together. Your identity was set in the earliest moments of your existence. He knows you completely. Your identity was set in adoption into God's family as his child. You can call out to him. Your identity is a gift from God, salvation through grace. You can do his good work. Your identity is hidden with Christ to appear in glory. You await his return. And our identity is knit together with each other. We praise the one who called us into light. Identity is something that we learn over time. And just like Jonathan and Sarah, as if we had amnesia, we're waking up to what our identity is. The Bible has these incredible truths about who we are and who we have become in Christ, our identity now in Him. With these truths in mind, pick up your life's backpack. Stand up, take a deep breath, and let's journey on together. Thanks for listening to this inspiration from Ken Park. For more information, visit our website, churchatthecenter.com. God bless.